Welcome to the Real Python Podcast. This is episode 187. Do you need to transfer an extensive data collection for a science project? What's the best way to send executable code over the wire for distributed processing? What are the different ways to serialize data in Python? Christopher Trudeau is back on the show this week bringing another batch of PyCoders Weekly articles and projects. Christopher shares a tutorial by RealPython author Bartosz Jaczynski titled Serialize Your Data with Python. This comprehensive guide moves beyond XML and JSON to explore multiple data formats and their potential use cases. It's a deep dive into the topic and provides a thorough resource for future reference. We also discuss a real Python tutorial about naming conventions in Python that use single and double underscores. The piece covers differentiating between public and non-public names and APIs, writing safe classes for subclassing purposes, and avoiding name clashes with keywords. We also share several other articles and projects from the Python community, including a couple of release announcements and news items, a discussion about never being taught how to construct quality software, building a small REPL in Python, using the key parameter in Python functions and methods, a framework for RESTful APIs using Flask and SQL Alchemy, and a Rust-based HTML sanitizer for your Python projects. All right, let's get started. The Real Python Podcast is a weekly conversation about using Python in the real world. My name is Christopher Bailey, your host. Each week, we feature interviews with experts in the community and discussions about the topics, articles, and courses found at realpython.com. After the podcast, join us and learn real-world Python skills with a community of experts at realpython.com. Hey, Christopher. Happy New Year. Welcome back. Yes. Uh, happy arbitrary calendar demarcation to you as well. Yeah. <laughs> Well, we have a collection of stuff that kind of happened over this sort of break that we took. We got a few news items and then some kind of fun topics. There's a bit of a theme going on with topics for me, at least best practices and things that happen inside of Python that I think are kind of interesting. We again have a discussion, which I'm excited to kind of dig into. So I guess we should start with the news. You want to get going with that? You say you have a theme like we did it on purpose. <laughs> uh, sure. So uh, over the over the holidays, a uh, big commit was made to the C Python interpreter, and that is the JIT compiler. If you're new to this idea, JIT stands for just in time, and it's a process that dynamically writes machine code to optimize your software on the fly. Other Python interpreters have JITs, but this is new to the core C Python version. And we're going to be linking to both the commit itself and a set of slides that talk about what's in it. The commit's kind of a fun read. <laughs> yeah. Brent Butcher, who's the committer, he got a little creative and wrote a poem in the vein of The Night Before Christmas. So uh, even if you're not interested in the code, the uh, the commit's worth reading. If you're digging into the slides, they're posted on GitHub, which does this weird thing with PDFs. There's this little more pages button buried at the bottom every few slides that loads the next chunk. I missed it the first time, and I was kind of confused as to why the whole thing was rather short. <laughs> so I'm sure if you all go back in there and see that, you'll immediately laugh at me and go, well, but the button's right there. What's wrong with you? It's in front of your face. So, you know, have a good laugh. And then the other chunk of news for any Django knots out there, it, yeah, that's what they call themselves. I, I don't. But bug fixes dropped for 4.2.9 and 5.0.1. If you're playing with 5.0, which was recently released in December, you definitely want this one. It's got a, about a half dozen regression fixes in it, so you want to go get on top of that. Yeah, that's a fun read from Brant Booker. Yeah, <laughs> that was very Christmassy themed, so definitely check it out. All right, so we'll dig into topics here. My first one is from our friend Leodanas Pozo Ramos, who's having a nice little break right now, so I'm hoping he's enjoying as is extended holiday break. And this tutorial is about naming conventions in Python, specifically ones that involve the underscore character. For a beginner, I think this is really illuminating. Like you look at other people's code and you go, boy, that's an interesting way to name things. <laughs> Why add this sort of arbitrary at the time as you look at it, underscore character in different places? 
there's a lot of conventions that were built up and you can learn a lot by just digging through this article. I think definitely for a beginner, it's like I said, illuminating, but for someone coming from another language, it's going to help explain some of these concepts and the ways that Python does it. Python is a very dynamic language. We talk about that a lot here. If you're coming from something, I'll call it more rigid, <laughs> like Java, there's different ways of handling these sort of concepts and so forth. Um, so there's five of them that are discussed, five different ways that the underscore is discussed in this article. The first that he covers in a lot of detail is the single leading underscore. So it'd be like underscore and then the variable name. And it indicates, again, this is the the core idea. It, it has to do with sort of object-oriented programming and APIs, the sort of application programming interfaces, not so much of a web API, but how other programmers are going to use your code and interact and you know interface with your code and how they should use it. So in the case of the single leading underscore, it indicates that it's meant for internal use only. So it should be only used within the, the framework itself um, as opposed to outside use, sort of this idea of, we'll dig into it more of public versus non-public methods and attributes. There's another one that's at the tail of something um, in naming things. The single trailing underscore is used to avoid naming conflicts with Python keywords or built-in names in case you have names that only make sense to match up with what a keyword is. Um, I think there's lots of other ways around this, but this is something you may see out there. The third one was uh, about the double leading underscore. This one is sometimes called name mangling, and it triggers this feature in this context of Python classes. And if you're having things that inherit, and it can help with sort of auto naming things for you by creating it this way. And he digs into that. There's uh, the most common one that we've talked about on the show, which is the double leading and trailing underscore, sometimes called the dunder methods with, you know, again, two underscores before the name and two underscores after. And that would indicate that it's a special attribute and or method. What's interesting is right, I think this week, laid on us, had another article that came out that's talking about Python's sort of magic methods or dunder methods, special methods, different names for the same thing, and leveraging them. So I'll include a link to that. He doesn't go into a lot of detail about dunder methods in this article, this tutorial, but he has an entire separate one that just came out here at the top of January. And then the last is uh, sort of interesting uses for a single underscore by itself, and it indicates a temporary or a throwaway variable, and there's an interesting way that that works. So to kind of dig into the heart of this thing, he spends the most of the time talking about this public and non-public methods and attributes and how this works. A, a public attribute or method, you can use them in your own code or the client's code, whereas something that's private, or in this case, non-public for uh, the use as we're describing it here, you would use them only from within inside the defining class and its subclasses. So he takes you through the thought process there, provides copious code examples, kind of going through it, creating public and non-public names, avoiding pitfalls, and how knowing this will help you. And I'm not sure how often you will use this. It, I guess it depends on how you've kind of built your code. He gives three major reasons for doing this. The first is preventing incorrect usage of your code. To be able to mark internal parts of your code with non-public names allows you to guide users through the correct usage of your code, like what should be considered use for non-public or public use. It improves the readability of your code if you're doing this thing of creating non-public stuff, it, it definitely identifies them easily. And then it avoids name clashes. Uh, using non-public names can help you avoid collisions in packages and modules and classes. He describes how wildcard imports work with that and how non-public names using you know the import star thing, Python enforces a, a behavior about how things would not be imported by a wildcard import that have that. And then he goes into these other uses a little bit more, name mangling, um, again, another convention that's using the two leading underscores in an attribute or method names. And when you name an attribute or method with using this, Python will automatically rename it by prefixing its name with the class name. 
and it'll have like a single underscore after it. So this is something that will make a lot more sense sort of visually as you kind of go through the article. The goal is to prevent name clashes in, in inheritance. And again, to define non-public members, you always want to use the single leading underscore. The trailing underscore in Python names, this is a kind of an odd use case in my opinion. It's like something if you wanted to use you really wanted to use the variable name list. <laughs> so like list equals square brackets one, two, three. Well, now you've, if you've assigned that to the name list, you've rewritten over the list callable function that is built into Python that you can create lists with. And if you were to you know, try to create a list using list parentheses and have it turn something into a list, it it basically would say this is not no longer a callable function. And so it's kind of an interesting thing. I don't, I would definitely avoid renaming keywords <laughs> if you can, but this is a way that you can do it by just adding an underscore after it. It's an interesting, again, convention. And then he digs into the Dunder name special methods, how they're used. But again, this other article digs way deeper into that. The last one, again, was this idea of the underscore just by itself. I haven't used this a ton, but this is a, a common practice. And one of the interesting things that always kind of surprised me is that if you're working in a REPL session, it's a special variable that will contain the result of whatever you just evaluated. So like if you typed 3 plus 12, 15 will show in there. You could actually type the underscore hit return and it will return that as this sort of variable so it has a special re return value so it's sort of assigned as the last thing you evaluated which is interesting i've seen it commonly used in loops and sort of other constructs this is the convention that people do i would prefer naming something explicitly but again it's common that you may see some somebody use underscore in this as it's going through and iterating through like a for loop or something I use it a fair amount, actually. It's typically when you've got a tuple that you're trying to unpack and you're not interested in one part of the tuple. Okay, just an easy way to see it. Rather than naming it, because then you're producing a variable that you're never going to use, it's kind of a signal to the developer that that third thing in the tuple, I, I want the first and second thing. You know, I, let's say we've got... Oh, uh, okay. I've got first, middle, and last name in a tuple, and I don't want the middle name. I'm going to say first, comma, underscore, comma, last. and that tells the programmer I'm not going to use the middle name. It's potentially going to be just tossed as it yeah. goes. Okay. Yeah, essentially. Yeah. Okay. So that that kind of uh, then is an indication, a convention of, yeah. of like temporary. Exactly. Probably using it. Okay. And that's great. why it sh tends to show up in loops a lot because you're doing that on the iterator out of your, you know, what you're looping on. Yeah. A lot of these conventions are described in PEP8. If you haven't dug deep into PEP8 and read through it, definitely as a beginner, that is useful because those are the unique things that are happening inside of Python as far as how you should name things, the ways things could be used. And he provides links and quotes to those sections of that. And I was going to ask you, Chris, like not only the underscore one, do you use some of these other ones? Is it, are they common practices for you? Some I do, some I don't. A lot of it depends on the code. A couple libraries that I've contributed to, people are like hardcore about it. That like if okay. this isn't if this isn't a variable that I expect people to use, then I'm going to put the underscore on front of it. And I've even seen people get to the point of where they're like using the underscore internally, and then the property it smells a little like Java to me at that point. <laughs> um, so like, right, right, right. I, I will use it when. I, I tend to use it a lot if I'm using a property where the property has to have a side effect. So there'll be the internal version of it, which has the underscore and then the actual property method that causes the side effect to happen. So if you're getting into properties and descriptors, that's that's a place where I'll use it. Okay. Deep into OOP stuff. Yeah. Essentially, yeah. Back in the days when I was a Java programmer, I was hardcore about like, this should be private, this should be protected, and I'm trying to save the next developer from themselves. And honestly, as I picked up Python, I kind of gave a lot of it up. I'm sort of like, you know what? I, if you want access to that variable, use it. Why, why am I trying to protect you? Like, who am I trying to protect and from what? And particularly considering 90% of the time, I'm the one maintaining my code. <laughs> right. Like, 
I've become a lot less um, vigilant about it. Now, to me, it's I, I tend to use it for something that is like this really is supposed to be hidden for a reason. Okay. But I've, I've seen a, a wide spectrum of it in, in code, uh, other people's code that I've helped contribute to. What about the after <laughs> variable name? I almost never bother. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I would. I would come up with like uh, maybe a two word name or something. Yeah, I, you know, I, I'm not. Um, I, I try not to reuse soft keywords. I try not to rename functions. I, I find it just confusing yeah uh, and most of the time you know the example you used where you're like list underscore well it's going to be a list of something there's there's going to be a better name for it so yeah, it uh, you know yeah. that that tends to be my but i i'm picky about my variable names so yeah, you know, yeah. i'm super picky about it you know even in teaching it i want to have something that is something beyond the foo and bar and things like that so yep there's a there's a funny uh well I think it's funny because it, it, it's like kind of over the top comment at the end of this. It's the only comment that's there, but it, and he's like, "Great article," and why I never want to go near Python. <laughs> <laughs> and it's yeah. like, okay, you know, great article, you explain it well, but craziness of Python. <laughs> that's like, I don't know if it's craziness, but it is a dynamic language, and so these were conventions that kind of came up, uh, you know in naming things and having to kind of plan stuff as opposed to having dedicated private and public and so forth. Yeah. If special symbols bother you, stay away from Perl. That's all I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. All right. Well, thanks again, Laodonis. It was a great tutorial. And if you're learning Python, it's one of these sort of like additional reads that can help you with uh, naming conventions, especially if you're doing the thing that we often suggest, which is reading other people's code. And you look at the code and kind of scratch your head and it's like, those are lots of interesting underscores and weird places. This uh, might help you with that. So. so what's your first one? My first article of 2024 is from Max Bernstein. And uh, his site is bernsteinbear.com, which is funny if you're familiar with that particular Mandela effect. Um, <laughs> yeah. the, the article is uh, Building a Small Repl in Python. And like all good titles, that pretty much sums it up. So if you've ever played with a command line tool that was REPL-like, well, Python allows you to override the behavior of the REPL, making it your own. An example of this is inside of Django, there's a management command called shell, which when you run it, you just get a Python REPL, but it's loaded all of the Django configuration bits inside already. So I've never looked at the code for it, but I suspect it's using the same kind of techniques that Max is talking about in this post. There's a module in Python called code that has a class called interactive console, and you can instantiate that and then call its interact method, and that runs the REPL. So essentially, you can write a script that invokes the interactive session with an import and two lines of code, and you're running the REPL inside of something you control. The interactive console object allows you to configure the REPL's title banner as well as an exit message. So those are two easy things to make it look like it's your own thing. And then the heart of it is a method called run source, which gets called each time somebody presses enter in the REPL. And this is how you can start writing your own stuff, adding commands or whatever. Overriding run source has some consequences, though, and it can muck with your access to the inline editing features. The article goes on to show you how to use the read line module to put this functionality back in. And as an example project, he shows you how to build tab completion for anything in Python's env dictionary, which includes things like the built-in functions, those things you probably shouldn't be renaming that we just talked about. Yeah. Max appears to have been building something on his own while he was writing this post, because near the end he goes, wait, there's this thing called the CMD module, the command module, which isn't as low level, and maybe I should have been using that instead. It also allows you to customize the REPL. So the last chunk of the article talks a little bit about why you might use CMD versus using code and the interactive console, and when you might use the lower level code and how. So if you need to write an interactive program, building it on top of the REPL can actually save you an awful lot of time. It gives you access to features you'd otherwise have to roll yourself, and you can like write Python inside of it as you go along. So if you're thinking about doing this, the, this article is not a bad place to start out And if you want to start trying to muck around here. I wonder about some of these, what we often call an alternative REPL, things like B Python or PT Python. I wonder which methodologies they're using to, to create those. I, yeah, I suspect a lot of it depends on what you're doing. Some of them, I think, are probably not built on top of the REPL because they're like complete alternative mechanisms. Yeah. 
Sure. And then others, Beat Python seems to just sort of add a few of its own commands and a little bit of extra editing. And it's not that far off from the kind of things Max is talking about in the article. So it would surprise me if they didn't build it on top of it. Yeah. The Django one, I'm, you know, all it really does is load the Django stuff in the background and make it available to you. So I'm 90% sure all they've done is gone import, <laughs> import, import, call interactive, and there you go. Right. Yeah, yeah. So that makes sense. Great. My next one is from Steven Gruppetta, who's written for Real Python several times, and we've featured a few of his tutorials on here. And he has his own blog, site, newsletter project. I don't know what to call it. Uh, his whole thing is known as the Python coding stack, and that's where this is coming from. And <laughs> hey, it's another repeated thing that's used multiple times in Python. <laughs> in this case, it's the word key. <laughs> His sort of jokey title for it is the key to the key parameter in Python. The word key, yep, lots of different uses. Probably think of key slash values in, in dictionaries. Um, we talked about keywords just a moment ago several times. God, there's a, a few other ones. But in this particular case, what Steven's talking about is the how there's some built-in functions that allow you to change the behavior of how this function is going to work by adding key equals. The two examples that he kind of digs into have to do with sorting. Uh, he talks about sorted and dot sort, which have kind of similar functionality depending on what you're sorting. He goes through the default behavior of how if you're sorting a list and it would sort it numerically or if you're working with text, it would or strings, it would be doing that alphabetically. There's already a, a feature built into sort for saying I want it to be reversed. But in this case, let's say I want to sort by completely different rules. And you can use this key and key equals inside of there as a parameter. And you basically throw a function into it. So you say key equals, maybe you want to use something like uh, the you know, length of your strings. And so you could use, or maybe they were uh, a list of lists or something like that. So if you put len in there, you don't call it, so you don't put parentheses after it, you put key equals len. At that point, it would then sort, say, these strings, or like I said, a list of lists or something like that by the length of the elements in there or the characters. So you can use any kind of built-in functions if you want, something like min or max, as a way to sort of choose how you want the sorting to go. You can also define your own functions and create them as rules for sorting. So in that case, you would, outside of where you're calling the sorting, you would define your own function. As you've named that, you would then put the name of the function after key. And I've used this a handful of times. Um, it's a very useful thing in data science when you're working with lots of different parameters to kind of clean up things or sort things or do other stuff. So it gives a handful of other examples. Probably the more common way I've seen it used is not to define the function outside of it and then put key equals, but put to put key equals and then have a lambda right there. So you're doing it in line. So it goes through that, shows you the process of setting this up, gives a couple other examples. And then he shows a few other places that you may see key that are other than sorting. Iter tools has a group by function that allows for a key. Uh, so you could group by the size of things or, you know, maybe you want to sort or group by some other kind of parameters. There's a few other places where this key parameter appears inside of the pandas library, such as like sort index or sort values. And again, grouping so uh, something to look out for, a way to customize these functions to give you, or methods to give you a lot more flexibility just by adding this. And what's nice is, again, if you are doing it as a Lambda, that is one way to do it. But if you are doing this often, it's something that you could create your own little library of simple functions that you could then reuse across, again, if you're doing cleaning, sorting, preparing things and something like a data science setup, um, which was really common for me. It's a nice quick read to go through, lots of little examples. He has a couple of kind of uh, interesting ones where he's like, try to guess what I'm trying to do here, <laughs> which is kind of fun to kind of look through. So uh, thanks, Stephen. I'm intrigued to see uh, how his 
his new thing goes he's he has some numbers in there of like how he's been growing this since nine months ago his uh, python coding stack so good luck with that steven He's got some interesting stuff in there. Um, particularly, he's got a bit of a knack for analogy. So yeah. there's a, a couple of better articles on um, sort of computer science-y things where he has some very entry-level explanations as to why they are and how they work. You know, he, I think he ended up writing an article on cues where he was like showing teddy bears in boxes and things like that. It just sort of... <laughs> Yeah, it made it clearer to rather than getting into the details of something that's sort of a high high level, better understanding kind of stuff. He's he's, he's got some interesting writing on the uh, on the site. Yeah, definitely. This week, I want to shine a spotlight on another real Python video course. It continues one of the themes this week about best practices for naming variables, functions, and how to write high quality, readable Python code. This course is titled Writing Beautiful Pythonic Code with PEP8. It's based on a RealPython tutorial by Jasmine Finer. And in the course, RealPython instructor Joe Tatusco takes you through the various Python naming conventions, building a beautiful Python code layout, which includes line lengths, line breaking, blank lines, and indentation. Formatting comments, whether they're block, inline, or documentation strings, using linters for better code, and additional tips and tricks to help ensure your code follows PEP8. I think it's a good investment of your time to learn the best practices from the official style guide for Python code, PEP8. Like most video courses on Real Python, the course is broken into easily consumable sections, and all our courses have a transcript, including closed captions. Check out the video course. You can find a link in the show notes, or you can find it using the search tool on realpython.com. So what's your next one? I've got a real Python article by Guru Bartosz Zajinski. Probably heard us talk about articles from him before. He's kind of outdone himself. Uh, this one's even deeper than usual. This is on serialization, and it's called Serialize Your Data with Python. Serialization is the process of turning some data in memory into another format typically so it can be put onto disk or onto a network. And then, of course, you want to be able to deserialize it back into memory later. Uh, there are a ton of ways of doing this in Python, and depending on what kind of data you're serializing, why you're doing it, and you know a whole bunch of choices along the way, and this article covers all of them. I'm pretty <laughs> sure it covers all of them. <laughs> yeah. It, uh, so it starts out by explaining serialization at a high level and some of the complexities that you can run into. So, for example, are you going to serialize into a binary format or text? If you're using text, what kind of text? Unicode, good old ASCII, some sort of encoding that can survive being inside a URL. Your choice affects what you can do and who you can share the serialized data with. Processing binary data tends to be faster than text and also tends to take up less space, but then it isn't generally as portable. There's a chance the code deserializing your data isn't in the same language as your software, so the portability thing might be an issue. Once you've made that high-level format decision, another thing to consider is whether your serializer supports a schema. A schema is a formal description of the expected structure of the document. Schemas tend to enforce rules about what you are serializing. For example, XML on its own is schemaless. Uh, you can write a well-formed XML document using whatever tags you like. But if you want a web browser to be able to display it, it better follow the schema for HTML. Yeah, that might be a bad example as browsers are rather forgiving about schema violations, but you get the general idea. I've been talking about this article for a few minutes now and have skipped a whole lot, and I still haven't got past section one. So uh, <laughs> like I said, very deep dive. Yeah. Section 2 talks about serializing Python objects. Uh, you can use the pickle module, for example, which is a Python-specific format, or you can translate your object into something like JSON. There are pros and cons of both. Pickle is more powerful with fewer restrictions on what can be serialized, but it's Python-specific and has some security risks. So essentially, you're going to need Python to read it. JSON, on the other hand, has a few limitations. You can't serialize all Python objects with it, but it's more or less ubiquitous across the internet, making it kind of the king of data interactivity at this point. Yeah, so much so that there's like five different versions of it as well, and one of which includes schemas if you need them. <laughs> 
The article goes on to talk about serializing executable code, serializing for HTTP message protocols, hierarchical and tabular data, and then some details on using schema-based libraries. Pretty much everything you want to know about serialization is in here and possibly some stuff you didn't know you wanted to know. So <laughs> yeah. as often with Bartage, very, very deep article here and lots of good stuff to sink your teeth into. Yeah, it's a great resource, which is a, a common thing we say <laughs> for Bartage's stuff. It's one of those that you would come back to as, as you're like, oh yeah, this is a nice reference. It's nice that we do that here at RealPython, that that's a common thing for us to say like, oh, I have a question about this. And you may only be hitting that little portion of the article or the tutorial. Or if you want to dig, dig deep into it, this is uh, definitely one of those things. All right. Well, we have a discussion this week, which is kind of fun. We haven't done one in a little while. And this is one that you found about building quality software, which you've talked about a little bit over the last several months. We didn't really talk about it from this angle, which I think is kind of uh, good. And we both have very different perspectives on it. So I think it'll uh, be fun to dig into. Yeah. It's, Do you want to introduce it? Sure. It's based on an article by a gentleman named Florian Bellman. Uh, and uh, it's titled, You Are Never Taught How to Build Quality Software. And found it through a associated hacker news discussion, of course. The article talks about the fact that most schools focus on the mechanics of software development, like algorithms, yeah. with a varying degree of coverage on topics like quality. This is one of the things that immediately got nitpicked on Hacker News, because, you know, anytime you say this doesn't get taught, someone goes, but I was taught it. So, <laughs> right. Or I teach it was one of the things Or I, I teach it, yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I suspect some of it is an age thing. I, I, I'm guessing it might get covered in schools a little more now than, say, when you and I went through. And a lot of it, of course, comes down to the, uh, there's a wide variety of school programs out there. Right. And boot camps and such. And that focus on different things as well, right? So, uh, you know, your choice and what you did wasn't necessarily what everyone else does. The article goes on to talk about the fact that most companies focus on time and money, and neither of those things tend to lead to quality products. Yeah. There's an old adage, which is fast, cheap, right, pick any two. And that tends to be a problem for projects everywhere, not just software. The second half of the article has a subtitle, which is how to get out of the hamster wheel and covers some ideas for addressing a lack of quality while in development. Uh, he highlights knowing how to talk to management, speaking their language so that they understand quality issues are also cost issues. Talks about the fact that everything is a balance. You can't spend so much time on quality that the product never ships. Yeah. Connected to that, the fact that you need some measures so you can know whether or not you're doing a good job or not and when to move on. As we, we kind of joke about it all the time, and then the internet. So uh, there's there's uh, there's a lot of lot of stuff, in, including some uh, interesting little branches here, and the hacker news conversations. I, you and I have sort of different backgrounds in this stuff, so maybe you want to chime in uh, where you think, and then we can compare and contrast a little bit. Yeah, well, I definitely agree with the idea that this definitely wasn't taught when I was taking some of my you know, engineering courses. This was like really, really early on. Again, this was a long time ago. And then when I got back into programming, it wasn't something that was necessarily shared as far as like best practices and stuff like that. And QA wasn't even really something that we dug too much into. It was always like the, the jobs that I had were always um, almost like individual facing. I was always working with either a, a small team of people and I was, you know, assisting them and building things for them or, uh, you know, creating tools for them. And then when I struck out on my own and kind of started my own, I guess you call it like a software business where I was building tools for uh, small businesses, I kind of developed my own methodologies for doing this. And it involved constantly iterating. And I, I guess it would be similar to way people would think of design sprints and things like that, where I would like meet with the client and like, okay, give me an example of what you're doing now. Hand me the literally the documents and things that you're creating. And then I was creating input tools and other things that were mirroring things that they were doing. But I'm like, okay, but we can make a software tool that combines all this together and simplifies it and does a lot of the work for you. And so I would always be the boss never could answer the question, so I would always go to the individuals <laughs> and ask them very specifically to get, you know, what they're doing. And and they were my testers. 
So it was kind of a very different working process. And so I don't have that large team, you know, integrating things or building on top of other people's software. Often it's, it was very much kind of solo development. So I don't have as much experience. I've talked a lot about it on the show. In fact, I had Dane Hillard on. He was back in episode 49. We we called it the challenges of developing into a Python professional. And the idea as you leave school, you have all these skills and you kind of understand how to program. But what do you need to know to work in a professional environment and actually do the work. And they talk about a lot in the sort of description, in, in, you know, back and forth in the Hacker News thing where, yeah, but that's that's software design or whatever versus computer science and that kind of weird thing that how many classes were you ever learning truly about the design of software and creating quality software and so forth and almost sort of like, adjacent to that project management. <laughs> Those are definitely some of the things that I, I did go back to school for a little while and did have a program where we went into project management. And I did learn a lot of, I think, good skills in that, just kind of even thinking about how to work with a team and sort of set goals and work with these, the typical types of charts and stuff as you kind of work along. I'm intrigued by things that were coming up in the discussions, besides the noise that's in there. And I had a question for you, which is this sort of idea of, I hear a lot of people talk about test-driven development. And then I also hear the idea about building tests along as you go, as you sort of complete things. And I feel like that's not necessarily test-driven development at that point. Like there's a kind of a very different way of thinking of it where like you have to write the test and then the software is written around it, which I think is interesting. And then he had a third way of describing it that he feels like was the common experience that he was having in this article of we get all the way to 90% done and oh my God, we need tests now. We need to do QA and, and see if all this stuff works. And and that seems to be maybe the, in his opinion, a very ineffective way of doing it uh, because it just ends up maybe wasting a lot of time. So I don't know if you want to dig into that a little bit about the idea of, I, I feel like testing is, is a big part of you know building quality software today. But I'm I'm intrigued by this idea, and we don't necessarily need to get into the mantras of one or the other. <laughs> there's a there's a hardcore component to TDD, yeah. which are sort of the people who came up with it that you know very much are the no, I will write the test first, and I know I'm done because it's green and it's passed. Okay. The challenge with that is you have to do a certain amount of upfront design because you have to know what the function is going to, what the parameters to the function are going to look like in order to be able to write the test first. Yeah. So you end up having to either on paper or in your head, think about exactly what this thing is going to do. A lot of the software I find when I write it, I tend to be very iterative at it, right? It's, it's closer to writing uh, English. I write something and then I go back and I'm like, oh, no, that's not right. And, and it's small, tiny little iterations, even on a function. Right. So it, 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 I very seldom would know exactly what the test would be before I've written the function because writing it is part of expressing that, at least for me personally. Right. And so that that's why I've tended away from the strict version of TDD. But part of what he's talking about in the article we talk about this sometimes in, in the Agile world, and I don't want to get into the whole waterfall versus Agile too much, but there's there's a, a phrase that gets used, which is something called the illusion of progress. And the idea is if you are leaving your tests until too late, your estimation ability and your knowledge of whether or not you're done is incorrect because I'm estimating, oh, how much is it going to take me to write this code rather than how much is it going to take me to write this code and the tests and QA it. And if I say this is going to take me two days and then I hand that off to some project manager, then that project manager is going to, you know, they always go, oh, well, double the number or whatever, right. some magic, right? Gantt chart filled in. <laughs> yeah, you're not actually uh, grabbing an estimate about the work involved here and you're kicking the can down to the, the road to say the QA team or whatever. So to avoid that, what you want to try and do is small cycles and in those small cycles, you want the testing included as part of that. And to me, spiritually, I feel that still manages the idea behind TDD, which is don't release anything without testing it. Don't really release anything without having, without having automated tests. 
So I tend to code a little bit and then I write some tests and I code a little bit and I write some tests and okay. and I keep an eye on my coverage and I make sure that my coverage numbers are high. And I feel personally like that gets me as close as I need to without having to be so rigorous about the upfront. But there are people who disagree with me on this and definitely want to come at it from, you know, a more of a, you know, think about it first. And if that works for you, great. I'm, it's not, uh, I honestly can't say it's better or worse. I think it's part of it's a style thing. It doesn't fit as nicely with how I personally code. So it isn't, it doesn't tend to be what I do. And, and with everything, whenever you have a label like this, the labels end up meaning different things to different people. And then you can have these weird, how many angels does it take to dance on a pin kind of arguments about, you know, am I TDD or not? Well, I don't, I don't care what your label is. This is the approach I'm taking. Is it working for us or not on our team? Right? Yeah. There's a couple of good references in there. I just want to shout them out. Like the, uh, a handful of people mentioned the philosophy of software design, which I think we've mentioned that book a couple of times, and I'll include a link to it. I feel like some of university programs, they're geared for different things. They're not necessarily so, yeah, so the, gearing you for the job, you know? So the, the school I went to had both a computer science and a computer engineering department. Okay. When I was there, I was the first group of students in the computer engineering group that had a software specialty. They invented the software specialty as an option when I was there. That then turned into a software engineering program. So this this university currently has computer science, software engineering, and computer engineering as three different programs. Mm. And so like even within the same school, let alone from school to school, you see this huge difference in what you're emphasizing, where you're spending time. Yeah. And as an example, both us on the computer engineering side and the folks on the computer science side, we both took compiler courses. The computer engineering compiler course, we were given a partially implemented compiler and then we had to add features to it. The computer science people spent a large amount of time on the math and theory behind the compilers. I still don't fully grasp what LR1 look ahead stuff is. I've never needed it, so I've never dug back into it. Right. And I'm not saying there's not value in that, but I have built and mucked with compilers and understood them without needing that, right? So there's just different emphasis in that. There's only so many hours in the week. There's only so many years in the degree. And, you know, way, where you spend your time is going to change that, right? Yeah. And this is why you sort of see in the, the Hacker News conversation about, oh, well, we covered some of this stuff or we didn't cover some of this stuff, right? And, and I, like, there was a, a quote in there which I saw, which was, I took one of these classes in my master's programs this year, this year and they were totally obsessed with UML. And it's, it kind of amuses me that they're still, like, that's still there, right? And right. depending on, and, and honestly, even within the same program, some of it will be what is the prof interested in. So you may get a bit of, uh, you know, what the prof is doing research in and, and where that is, right? Yeah. Generally, I found my favorite profs were the ones who had worked and were like had come from the field and back to do their PhDs because they tended to have an awful lot more practical perspective on things. And that's kind of how I learned. So they tended to be able to teach me a little more about, you know, the realities of this and what it means to write the software and, you know, what quality looks like. When I was teaching myself SQL, there were a, a variety of resources I used. I was using uh, Linda and a few other kinds of like uh, resources with like video courses and so forth. And I really enjoyed that part of where people were talking about the design of databases and so forth, because I felt like, again, I was working with a lot of existing built things and kind of building solutions around them or reworking with them and so forth. So I would see okay, I kind of see why you structured it like this, you know, and, and so forth. But I can kind of also started to see, like, you know, why you want to pay attention to things like, you know, okay, I want to design this very specifically so that I can, ex you know, extend this and, and grow it out. That's something we got into deep uh, when I was talking with Dane about uh, extensibility, you know, this idea of like, okay, like, are you building this yourself into a corner, you know, <laughs> um, and and so forth. And And those are things that, it may not be in your education, you know, and it's something that hopefully you can kind of continue to keep learning and, and yeah. keep finding resources to kind of keep growing on it. But I think that's something that there's only so much they can kind of give you in, in a school program or even in a, you know, set of tutorials and so forth. And it's, it's definitely a, 
it's harder to talk about because it's really, you know, it's kind of like you get into like sort of case studies and things like that, you know? Well, and, and you know, it, although we apply the word engineering, uh, honestly, the field isn't there yet. Yeah. Like if you look at other kinds of engineering where there's a repeatability to it, uh, you know, everyone sort of talks about the whole, you know, bridges thing, right? It's like, well, you know, if we, we could build software the way we build bridges. Well, no, because that's <laughs> not how we build software. That's not what software is for. Right. There's a degree of rigor that can be brought to the practice, but you are building something unique and original every single time. And when you look at projects in the building world that are unique and individual, every one of them is tied to the, oh my God, that project went horribly, right? They, they, <laughs> you, you look up the Sydney Opera House, right? And, and like they weren't even sure while they were doing it whether or not they could make concrete do that. And as a result, it was like four times over budget and, you know, it took three times as long as it was supposed to. And every single software project is that, right? So it, it's always... Yeah. There's, there's a mix of both the art and the science. And the only way to learn how to be a better artist is practice and, yeah. you know, and working with other artists, right? So the raw materials change so much. And there's that too, yeah. yeah. Um, but this is, you know, there's there's a quote in in the uh, discussion, which is like internships are important. When, and I think I fully believe that, right? Like things like a co-op program or getting practice at doing these things can make all the all the difference in the world. The other thing, you know, I, I I loved the quote, if you believe you can ship bug-free code, it's time to switch careers. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's another good one about, well, then the manager's ex expectation to have a, you know, AI integrated thing shipped by next month, you know, or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and, you know, quality is a cost. Right. And so there's always needs to be that conversation about what do we want to spend on this and how much time do we want it, right? So when Word crashes, it's annoying. When your flight guidance software crashes, well, something crashes, right? So like, obviously, <laughs> yeah. you want to put yeah. a different degree of quality control into that, right? Yeah. And then the other aspect of that, too, which gets into it, and they talk about a bit of this in the discussion, is the idea of the cost of patching, right? So a lot of people are like, well, you know, hardware doesn't seem to be anywhere near as faulty as software. Well, that's because hardware tends to be harder to patch. And because it's harder to patch, you can't release and then release a fix tomorrow, right? Yeah. And, and in fact, you've seen this over our lifetime in video games, right? Like it was very rare to find a bug in a video game in like an Atari console right. because you couldn't patch it. Yeah. And it now they're like... Burned onto a ROM. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've, I've got the title screen done. I'm going to release it. Um, and, <laughs> yeah. and, bec and because you can just download it on the fly and because everybody's got internet access, that becomes easier, which means you don't have to spend as much time and money on the QA thing or you can do it a little bit afterwards. Yeah. And there's you know, debate as to whether or not that's right, but it allows a flexibility and it changes sort of people's perspective on it. Yeah, these smaller teams with all the early access stuff is really fascinating. I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm probably involved or whatever you want to call it <laughs> with uh, several different game sort of projects that still label themselves. I, I kind of think of it some ways as like version numbers, like, you know, point zero, you know, something. <laughs> But they point zero 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 exactly. something. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like, well, we're just gonna keep adding features as we go and bug, you know, you know, troubleshooting and so forth. But you've already paid your money, uh, theoretically. So like it's always kinda of, it's a, it's an intriguing development. And but I understand it. I mean, the, the idea of shipping a triple A massive game like just sounds crazy to me. You know, they'll, they'll introduce and drop a trailer or something and it's like coming in two years. And you're like, okay. Yes. <laughs> in some ways I, you know. Grand Theft Auto. I want it tomorrow. And yeah, <laughs> probably show up 2030. That's fine. Yes. <laughs> exactly. But yeah, I, I know. It was a good article and uh, interesting conversation. If you can get past some of the, the noise, as usual, um, on Hacker News. I guess I could go first here for projects. I went through a handful of projects this week and I couldn't get a lot of them running. I, I wish people would really specify, like, on GitHub, like what they were building it on, <laughs> you know, what OS, what, what, what version of the Python, all that kind of stuff. Give me some details. Cause like, I, sometimes I just cannot stand these things up and it's very frustrating. Yeah. I, I ran into this, uh, uh, Michael Kennedy and I were doing a thing on talk Python a few months back on a bunch of different HTMX libraries that were out there. And some of them weren't like even just libraries, they were like sample projects and stuff like that. And 
And I remember running into one of them. It was like, it has to be Python 3.8 and you must use poetry and you must be standing on your head. And if you look yeah. at it crossways, it won't work. And I'm like, <laughs> uh, or I'll just move on to the next one. So exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, a lot of the more elaborate the project is, you know, the the more it's like that. And yeah. so it's kind of interesting, you know, what what they're leaning upon. Um, but I found this one that I like. It's called Flask Muck uh, with a dash in between the two. It's sort of the subtitle is RESTful APIs Using Flask and SQL Alchemy. It's a project by Danny Teasling. I'll just read you what it says on GitHub. <laughs> Flask Muck, you don't have to worry about the crud, which is great. Flaskmuck is a batteries included de- declarative framework for automatically generating RESTful APIs with CRUD, the create, read, update, delete, endpoints in a Flask SQL Alchemy application stack and in as little as nine lines of code. The thing I really liked about the project that I'll share is just the documentation I think is really well done. I'll just give the headings. There's installation, <laughs> which is nice, kind of walking you through like, okay, how do you get this going? It includes a nice quick start, a section on how to use the REST API of it, uh, configuration, nesting of APIs, pre and post callbacks, supporting logical data separation, the idea of multi-tenancy, escape hatches, and then it ends with a, an, you know, a full-on API reference. So just really well-documented, which I, is kind of becoming one of these things as far as like, do I want to share this project? <laughs> well, maybe I want to make sure that at least has the documentation so that people can help themselves if they, they get stuck in it. So there's a lot of different frameworks and tools out there for, for doing this. And I like that this was, uh, again, well-documented, but also just a quick way to kind of stand things up and get working with APIs and working with a database and doing CRUD. So, and with common tools that we're familiar with. What's yours? Uh, my project this week is called NH3, and it's an HTML sanitizer. Uh, the name comes from the chemical formula for ammonia, which is fitting, as NH3 is a Python wrapper to a Rust-based tool called ammonia. And if you want to know why they called it ammonia, that's because there used to be an HTML sanitizer called bleach, and it's been deprecated. Uh, so uh, ammonia appears to be the replacement folks are using now. Users are tricky. You should never trust them. Some of them go past tricky to straight out evil. If your application, particularly your website, needs to take HTML as input, there's a chance that input has dirty, dirty stuff inside of it. So for example, HTML allows JavaScript. JavaScript allows things like cross-site scripting attacks. And if your web web page is showing input from users and that input is in HTML, you want to clean the HTML before displaying it, hence the need for a sanitizer. Uh, Bleach and ammonia generally take HTML, allow only a subset of the tags to be used, and then remove anything that's dangerous. So, for example, if I try to put some JavaScript in the page, it just gets stripped out and it's not there in the output. I used to use Bleach a lot in some of my Django sites. Uh, There were some JavaScript-based input editors that, you know, people could write stuff in HTML and do like underlines and bold and all that kind of stuff. But most of them now support Markdown as well. And so I've switched over to using the Markdown and then you don't tend to have to sanitize it. It's a lot easier to clean than HTML. But if you are still needing to accept HTML input, then Ammonia seems to be a good replacement from what I can tell. Shout out to Adam Johnson, whose article in December introduced me to NH3. Uh, If you're a Django person, this article shows you how to write a custom form field using the sanitizer. But if you're not a Django person, you can still call NH3 directly. It's not a Django-based tool. So if you're using HTML somewhere else, then this might be the thing for you. Nice. Adam always has lots of nice links and tools for all the Django people out there. (laughs) So... Well, uh, that's going to cover it for this week. Thanks for bringing all these articles and projects this week, Christopher. Good kickoff to the year. All right. We'll talk to you soon. Cheers. I want to thank Christopher Trudeau for coming on the show again this week. And I want to thank you for listening to The Real Python Podcast. Make sure that you click that follow button in your podcast player. And if you see a subscribe button somewhere, remember that The Real Python Podcast is free. If you like the show, please leave us a review. You can find show notes with links to all the topics we spoke about inside your podcast player or at realpython.com slash podcast. And while you're there, you can leave us a question or a topic idea. I've been your host, Christopher Bailey, and I look forward to talking to you soon.